So I want to move next into a discussion of the royal tombs of Ur that Sir Leonard Woolley unearthed back in the 1920s. And I also, after talking about that, I want to talk about uh, four different Sumerian myths, uh, four of their greatest myths. And the connection between them will become evident as the discussion moves along. But it has to do now with the problem of solving the problem of the Great Rift. We've already seen how civilization has split into a world of a great above, uh, where the gods dwell, and a great below, where the dead exist in darkness, eating clay, and a middle world where the human mesocosm has constructed a civilization out of the energy of human labor to create these glittering jewels, these oases in the deserts of Mesopotamia, which are designed to try and solve the problem of the Great Rift by acting as magnets to bring the gods like birds down uh, to come down and, and eat their food, basically, uh, to prevent bad luck from falling upon the Mesopotamians. But of course, as their civilization unfolded, uh, catastrophe after catastrophe began to pile up, and bad luck did indeed get worse for the Mesopotamians. And this could only be ascribed in their minds to the fact that the gods were withdrawing and becoming more and more astral, that is to say, more and more associated with the heavens, and more and more reluctant to coax down to their temples. And uh, so we'll see how this, how this plays out. Now, to begin with, I just want to mention um, a footnote, Franz Borkenau, um, in his book, End and Beginning, has a wonderful essay in there on the antinomy, the, the antinomy of the death cycle in relation to the three generations of civilization. So what he does there is he borrows from Toynbee the concept of three specific generations of civilization. And he says that the first, genera the first generation of civilization, namely the societies of Egypt and Mesopotamia, have an attitude toward death that he calls death transcending. That is to say, they want to deny death and get past it by building elaborate cartographies and maps of the afterlife. Then he says in the second generation of civilization with the Jews and the Greeks, the attitude turns around the other way and becomes a death accepting attitude insofar as the Jews and the Greeks weren't much interested in the afterlife or much really in the cult of the dead for that matter. So the afterlife just didn't really interest those two societies. So we have a kind of death accepting attitude. Then when the third gen generation of civilization comes in with the Christians, we begin to get a turn on the spiral back to the first generation insofar as the Christians now are very much concerned with the soul's salvation and with the afterlife. They are therefore death transcending, but they bring in now some of the structural elements of the second generation, namely the Greek and Jewish concern for ethics, and fuse the two together so that we get a higher turn of the spiral. The fourth generation of civilization that comes in with the rise of um, the high Faustian Western European civilization, starting with the Renaissance, when the Renaissance uh, goes back and reactivates the Hellenic world, we come back to the death accepting attitude of the Greeks and the Jews, and from that point ever since, Borkenau says, we've, we've become basically a death accepting society. Uh, and have basically ended up doing something that none of the other civilizations have done, namely deny the very existence of the afterlife altogether and even deny the existence of the soul. So that's how it has played out over time. But now what I want to do is make a modification of Borkenau's thesis here insofar as the Mesopotamians, as we have seen, were not really a death transcending culture in the same way that Borkenau says the Egyptians were. The Egyptians were clearly much more into the afterlife. It was clearly a much greater thing for them. And as we have seen with the mortuary rupture that led to the creative singularity that gave birth to the rise of high civilization, uh, the mortuary traditions are in abeyance during that period. Uh, and so at the, at the beginning of Mesopotamian civilization, we don't find much in the way of a new burial tradition, and there isn't all that much interest in the afterlife. So it's basically, like the Jews and the Greeks, a death-accepting civilization for which the accent is decidedly on this life and this world. But long about midway through their civilization, as they began to enter into a period of crisis and catastrophe with the rise of civil wars and such, um, they began to turn about 2600 BC with the rise of the royal tombs at Ur to become more like Egypt and become a death transcending civilization, which is now what we get for the first time in the so-called royal tombs of Ur that uh, Leonard Woolley dug up. Now, these tombs um, have no precedent anywhere in the history of Mesopotamia. They probably originated, uh, the idea originated from Egypt, where the custom, as we'll see when we get to the Egyptian discussion, of uh, killing off the entire court, giving them poison or strangling them when the king dies, 
originated in Egypt and, and came from there and possibly migrated to uh, Mesopotamia during the Egyptian, there may have been a, a, a war, an undocumented war between the Egyptians and the Mesopotamians. Um, we'll talk about that in the Egyptian discussion. But the practice does first appear, though, at the city of Kish, which is further north, uh, or is all the way in the south near the Persian Gulf. Kish is a Semitic city that is further in the north. And in 2700 BC, we actually see the first prototypes for these royal tombs. The practice begins at Kish. And long about this time, 2600 BC, which is, not coincidentally, the same time that Gilgamesh, the real historical Gilgamesh, was supposed to have lived, or conquered Kish. And so a century later, we shouldn't be surprised to see them taking on the practice of the royal death pits from Kish, where the practice was there, it, it had its inception, but the pits were much smaller and much less elaborate. Um, and taking it and magnifying it and apotheosizing it now because Or had access to riches that Kish did not. Or had a virtual monopoly on the trade routes going out south down the Persian Gulf to the three civilizations of Dilmun, Magan, and Maluha. And scholars believe those three societies to have been Dilmun was the island of Bahrain, which was a mercantile trading colony and also, as we'll see, uh, a city that was sacred to the dead. And beyond it, at, at Oman there, where, where present-day Oman is now, that was once Magan, which was a significant source for both copper and wood. Dilmun was, in fact, the middleman between Magan and uh, Ur, and the southern cities of Mesopotamia, which would have been Ur, Aruk, and Eridu. And Maluha would have been out the mouth of the Persian Gulf and just around the corner there to the Indus Valley, which civilization the great Harappan civilization was coming into being at exactly the same time, 2600 BC, that these royal death pits were going on in Ur. And indeed, some of the jewels, such as carnelian, um, that were used uh, that were used in these death pits came directly from the Indus Valley. The tradition that emerges there at this time of drilling, using a, a drill to cut through very hard stone beads and create necklaces out of them. All of that comes from the Indus Valley. So Ur was becoming very wealthy at this time. And so it inherited the death pit tradition from the north, from Kish, and used its resources to apotheosize the whole thing into a grand, elaborate display, which now I want to turn to and go ahead and look at. So now what I want to do is think of these death pits. Uh, basically, I, I think the way to think of them is to imagine them in, the, in your mind's eye as inverted ziggurats. They're, they're upside down ziggurats, basically. Everything in the Mesopotamian world uh, has a correlate for the great above and the great below. Everything that's in the great above has its mirror image in the great below. Inanna is the mistress of the great above, and her sister Ereshkigal is the mistress of the great below. Uh, her consort Nergal was regarded as the Enlil of the great below. Enlil was one of the great high gods, as we'll see here uh, in a moment. And there's a great staircase, as we've seen, leading down to Irkala that had seven gates that correspond to the seven planetary bodies up in the heavens and so forth. So the, everything that corresponds in the above must find its correlate in the below. And I believe that these great death pits were regarded as upside down ziggurats. So to do that, I want you to imagine one of them in your mind's eye. Let's take the most famous, the so-called King's Grave, and visualize it as this great rectangular pit that has been dug with sheer verticality 30 feet straight down into the earth. And it has a steep, before it was covered with dirt, it had a steeply sloping ramp down which a large procession of people, in this case 65, would have made their way to the bottom. These included uh, a choir of 10 singing women and a couple of harpists, one male, one female, six soldiers with spears guarding the entrance ramp, drivers for the two four-wheeled chariots, each pulled by teams of three oxen, and various other soldiers and courtiers lining the walls of the pit. And then in the corner of the pit, we find a rectangular tomb with a domed top shaped like a loaf of bread inside of which the king lay, the base, basically the sarcophagus. So uh, to think of this as the upside down image of a ziggurat, you've got the great ramp going down into the underworld there that corresponds to the staircase of the ziggurat leading up to the top and also finds its cosmological counterpart in the great staircase leading down, literally leading down to the underworld in Mesopotamian cosmology, down to Irkala. And then the pit in the corner uh, where the, the sarcophagus in which the king lay corresponds to the cella at the top of the ziggurat where the priest 
uh, had a sacred communion with the god that descended. And so uh, it really is a sort of upside down image of the ziggurat. Now the question then becomes, um, given what we know about the uh, um, general disregard that the Mesopotamians had for the afterlife, and we've seen how they pictured the underworld as a dark place in which the dead sat around choking on clay and doing nothing interesting. Why is it that now we have these death pits with all this joyful, lyrical uh, imagery? Uh, for example, if we look at some of the images on the great lyre in this grave, for instance, the one with a, the bearded bull's head made out of gold foil and lapis lazuli, we see a, sh a series of shell inlaid plaques that are vertically arranged along the front of the lyre which portray a sequence of scenes showing jovial animals preparing for a banquet. On another lyre, we see people sitting on stools drinking beverages. On the so-called standard of Ur from another tomb, we see rows of seated people with cups in their hands on one register, while the one below it shows people herding sheep and bulls, probably as offerings. On the reverse side of that, there's a battle scene, and so forth. So all the imagery, it's not very morbid. It's, it has the, the, a festival air about it, the air of a party. And clearly the death pits with all their joyful lyrical imagery and their great riches also has the feel about it of a party. So how does that square then with the original idea that the Mesopotamians had of the unappetizing nature of the underworld? And I think what's happening here is that the Mesopotamians are literally now trying to re-territorialize the underworld. They want to take everything with them. They're going to take the entire court down with them. The prototype for this is simply that in the early burials, what you find is an individual with flex knees and a couple of pots and maybe a dagger or a tool that he's found buried with because he's going to use those implements uh, when he wakes up in the afterlife. He's going to need those very same implements. So now, on that same principle, why not take the entire court with us, the royalty of Ur seem to be saying. Let's take the whole party down with us and transform the underworld into an extension of the world of the living. And in that way, uh, the Mesopotamians, I think, thought that they could recode and re-territorialize the underworld by lighting it up and reinscribing it so that it was no longer a dark and gloomy place, but rather a place that was essentially an extension of this world. And in that respect, then, this becomes part of the solution to the problem of um, the Great Rift. Uh, the first problem of solving the Great Below is to recode it in such a way that it's basically an annex of this world. Rather than subordinating this world to the misery of that world, that world simply becomes recoded as an image of this world, and it becomes an annex. We can have a party in the afterlife. That's why we're going to take everything with us, they seem to be saying here. So they're, they're re-inscribing. Uh, they're writing on the, the slate of their, as Deleuze would put it, their body without organs. Uh, they're rewriting the slate and putting a new set of codes on it so that the underworld becomes a fun place now. And I think that's what they were doing. And I think that's part of the, the, the solution to the problem. In becoming a death transcending society, they are also trying to solve the problem of the great rift. Here in this case, the rift between this world and the great below. But now, so what we need to do is look at the solution to the problem of the rift between uh, the human world, the mesocosm, and the macrocosm of the realm of the gods up in the heavens above, which are becoming increasingly more and more remote, since more and more disasters are now piling up and proliferating in this epoch of Sumerian civil wars. And for that, I think what we need to do is look at the story of Adapa, which uh, doesn't give us so much the solution to the problem as it states the problem first. And um, <clears throat> so that myth is the myth of the first man. Adapa's name sounds similar to the name of Adam, and that may not be an accident because Adapa was regarded in Sumerian mythology as the first man. He was originally one of seven sages, so he was part of a sacred set of seven sages, and he himself was the priest of the god Enki, who, as we have seen, is already... Uh, Enki is a combination of the... Of, he is an equivalent of the gods Poseidon, in that he's a great water god and the fish is sacred to him, but also Mercury in that he's also the god of the mind. He's the god that all the other gods go to when they have a problem because he always has the solution. And here his priest is Adapa. So Adapa is out fishing one day as the myth opens up, uh, undoubtedly to bring in more offerings to the temple at Eridu. And he's out fishing and the south wind comes along. The south wind perhaps personified as a kind of bird and it knocks him over so that he falls into the water. And uh, he utters a curse upon the south wind. And of course, in those days, curses being more magically effective than they are today, it actually crippled the south wind and destroyed it. 
But in Iraq, the south wind is absolutely essential for the health of the crops, especially the date palms and the barley. And so now the crops begin to die, and it's Adapa's fault. And the gods are, this is brought to their attention, and the high god Anu decides then to summon him up to the heavens to question him about this great error that he has now made. But his god, Enki, advises him now. He says, he tells him, gives him a couple of bits of advice. He says, Anu will offer you the bread of mortality. Basically, he'll give you the food of death. Turn it down, don't eat it, or you'll end up becoming a mortal. He takes that in mind. The other point is to, he says, when you come to the gate guardians, you'll encounter Demutsi and Ningish Zida, uh, both of whom were dying and reviving gods. Tell them that you are in mourning for their absence, and they will be suitably impressed, and they will put in a good word for you uh, with the high god. So Anu does this. He goes up to the gate, and he does this. He tells Demutsi and Ningish Sita that he's been mourning for them. They're suitably impressed with his piety, so they go to Anu and put in a good word uh, for him. He comes before Anu, and Anu is very impressed with this individual. The name Adapa means ideal man. He's very impressed with him, so he changes his mind and decides to offer him the food of immortality instead of the food of mortality. But Adapa doesn't know this, and so he's just being offered this food, and Enki has already told him to turn it down, so he does. He turns it down, and Adapa shrugs and raises his eyebrows and says, suit yourself, but I think you're being foolish, and he sends him back to the earth. But when he does that, um, he returns and brings death with him into this world. So the first man in mythology always brings death with him. And so we have to blame Adapa for our own mortality, and this becomes a statement of the problem that now uh, the Sumerians are going to resolve. Humans are mortal. The gods are up there, and they are immortal. And moreover, the human the human beings belong down here on the earth below, whereas the gods, the rightful place, is up there in the heavens. But notice that we've already seen an exception to that take place in which Adapa has been invited up to the heavens, so we're already making inroads from the human world into the world of the divine. So it at least sets the precedent uh, for that. So now let's turn to the next story to start looking at um, how the Mesopotamians begin to start solving the problem of the Great Rift. And this story is the so-called myth of Atrahasis. And Atrahasis is the Noah. He is the flood hero of the great Sumerian tradition. In Gilgamesh, his name is Utnapishtim, and in an earlier tradition, it was Zayasudra. So the character is the same, but it has three different names and three different traditions. But in this uh, myth, this is a Babylonian myth, it's, it's Atrahasis, which means all wise. He's the last man at the end of history, the man who survives when everyone else dies and is wiped out. So he is at the end of history, whereas Adapa was at its beginning. So what happens is that the myth begins by recounting a revolt amongst the lower gods. They're known as the Agigi. And they decide to revolt against the higher gods, the Anunnaki, because they don't want to do their, they don't want to be their slaves anymore. They don't want to do uh, all the w work of bringing, you know, tilling the fields and digging the irrigation ditches. So they lay down their tools, and there's a revolt. Now, meanwhile, inside the great temple, where the three great high gods are, Anu, and his two sons, Enki and Enlil, and Enki and Enlil are a pair of battling brothers, exactly like Horus and Set. They're always at odds with each other. Enlil is the god of the farmer. Uh, his father, or rather his son, Ninurta, invents the plow, and he invents the hoe. And um, Enki himself is associated with the traditions of the craftsman. So it's the craftsman, the god of the craftsman, versus the god of the farmer. They're always at odds. But now uh, Enki comes up with the idea, because he always solves the problem. He says, let's create a new race of beings. We'll make human beings. They'll do all the work for us now, since these lower gods don't want to do it. They agree to do that, and so they what they do is they take the god who led the revolt, Awilu, they kill him, they cut him up, and they mix his blood with some clay, and from out of that, they create the first 14 human beings, basically seven males, of whom Adapa must have been one of them, and seven females, and <clears throat> this represents the beginning of humanity. So this solves the problem, and now... The human beings begin to set themselves to work to build civilization, and they reconstruct the divine prototypes, they get everything up and running again, and slowly over time these metropolises become noisier and noisier and noisier, more and more overpopulated, and the gods can't sleep, especially Enlil. He can no longer sleep because human beings now uh, are making too much noise, so he decides he's going to thin out the population by sending a plague down upon it, so he sends a plague. Now, Atrahasis is the all-wise individual who happens to be living in one of these cities, and he also, like Adapa, 
is sacred or is a priest to Enki. And Enki tells him, what you need to do to avert this is tell the people that they need to build a temple to the plague god Namtar, and he will be shamed once that temple is built and his, he is recognized. He will be shamed and he'll make the plague relent. That's what Atrahasis tells the people, that's what they do, and that's exactly what happens. The plague relents. But now the noise still continues, and so Enlil does this on two more occasions. He tries to thin out the population by sending a famine uh, and more desiccation, and eventually he decides neither one of those is going to do the, the trick, and besides, Enki is helping humanity every time, so he needs to figure out a way around this. So he decides to send a flood to wipe all of humanity out this time, kill every single one of them, and he specifically tells Enlil this time, don't you betray me this time, because I'm sick of you doing this. And Enlil says, okay, I won't. But since, or Enki says, okay, I won't. But since Enki is the god of the mind, he always figures out a way around this. So instead, this time he appears to Atrahasis in his dreams, instead of appearing directly to him. This is how he gets around it. And he has the wall speak to him instead of appearing directly in the dream. And the wall tells him that a flood is coming. He better construct an arc, and it will be in the shape of a cube. Its width will equal its height and its breadth and its depth. It will be basically in the shape of a cube, and we'll find out why in the next discussion on Gilgamesh. Uh, and he does this, so Atrahasis starts building this ark, and he decides to leave the city that he's in, which may have been Nippur, I think, which is somewhere in the middle of Mesopotamia, and travel south to the city of his god, Eridu. And he, once the ark is up and running, he puts the animals in it and puts uh, his wife and children in it, and they survive the flood. The flood comes, and for uh, seven days and nights, it rains and rains and storms. All of humanity is wiped out, and then... Uh, Atrahasis is saved. His ark comes to rest on the top of Mount Nazir, and he opens it up, and the first thing he does is he sends out three birds, a swallow, and a raven, and a dove, and eventually one of them doesn't come back, so he knows it's okay to come out now. Land has reappeared. He comes out, and when the gods see this, they come down, and en Enlil now is furious that human beings have survived, and he demands to know from Enki why he has betrayed him yet again, and Enki tells him, well, I was only looking after our own welfare because if we don't have the humans around to feed us with the sacrifices and do the work for us, then we're going to be in trouble. Enlil relents, <clears throat> and he realizes that Enki is right, so he says, okay, you're right. Um, so what happens is that uh, Atrahasis and his wife are then rewarded with immortality, and they are placed at the mouth of the two rivers, which is the sacred land of Dilmun. So, Part of the solution to the problem is by, uh, of the Great Rift is now we have a human being who now becomes the hinge between the realm of the Great Above, because now he's immortal, and the Great Below, because now he's going to be a kind of Lord of the Dead on this world in the Mesocosm. He's going to be a Mesocosmic equivalent of Nergal, the Lord of the Dead in the Underworld. And this plays out in the following way. Scholars believe that Dilmun <clears throat> was actually the island of Bahrain. <laughs> Now, Bahrain, when it was originally excavated in the 19th century, was thought to be a necropolis because there were hundreds and hundreds and thousands, uh, over 175,000 graves have been found on the island. There's a lot of them. And so it was assumed initially that Dilmun must have been a necropolis. And after all, Dilmun was regarded as the paradise, the Mesopotamian holy land, somewhat the way the Shiite Muslims would regard Karbala as the holy land. It's the place you want to get to. And part of the reason for that now was that Bahrain is unique in the Persian Gulf in that it has surrounding it a number of freshwater sources that are located in and around the island under the waters. Um, and these fresh waters would have been regarded as uh, conduits from the er, primordial abyss, the Apsu, of which Enki is the lord. And Enki's son, Enzak, is the primary god of this island. So... Not only that, but there was a baptismal cult practiced on the island. Uh, there were a number of temples that were unearthed, all of which have sacred wells at them. So there was some sort of baptismal cult, a little bit like uh, at the city of Mohenjo-Daro, where we find a great bath there. And indeed, there may be a cultural connection between the, the two. As we've seen, Malua and Dilmun were, were connected by trade routes. But then it was found that there was all this mercantile activity on the north part of the island. There was these little tra trading colonies. And scholars assumed then that it must not have been a necropolis, but must have been a normal trading city. And the burials could all be explained because, after all, they play out over the centuries, clear down to the Hellenistic age, as just the normal place for ejecting the dead over time. 
The problem, though, with this is, number one, Dilmun, as we have seen, was a sacred place. It was always regarded as the place to get to, an Eden, a, a source of the great uh, abyssal waters. There was a pearl tradition, as there still is on Bahrain to this day, uh, a pearl diving tradition, and pearls were known as fish eyes. They were thought to confer immortality on one if one consumed one of them. Um, and also the fact that Bahrain was uh, the graves do not, most, the vast majority of them, and there are over 175,000 of these things, date from the period of 2500 BC to 1800 BC. After that, Dilmun became, was no longer a going concern. By the time you get to the Cassites, 1400 BC, Dilmun is history. So most of these burials do take place in the period in question here, at the tail end of the development of Sumerian civilization. So it most likely was a sacred holy land that people wanted to be buried at. 175,000 graves, and not only do we find all of these graves, and we find nowhere, anywhere in Mesopotamia, do we find this many graves anywhere. This may partially explain why so many of them are found on Dilmun, because people wanted to get to Dilmun to be buried there. It was the place to get buried. That was where you wanted to be buried. Uh, there's a vast heterogeneity on the island of burial styles. There are these mounds extending as far as the horizon, as far as you can see. There are giant royal mounds. There are tombs without mounds. There's a vast honeycomb-like, hive-like uh, necropolis where the graves are linked to, to, to each other like cells in a, in a, in a hive uh, at, the, play, at the, uh, the, the archaeological site known as Sar. There's another burial tradition called the Uman Nar burial style that comes from Oman, in which there are these great mausolea in which the dead are thrown in in these di disarticulated pits of bones, and so forth and so on. So clearly, uh, people from differing burial traditions are coming to the island. They want to be buried there. It's a sacred place. And so this is the reason why Atrahasis is not only made immortal, but he's placed specifically at Dilmun to become a kind of earthly equivalent of the Lord of the Dead. He may have been the priest of some sort of water cult there, we don't know, but he becomes the earthly equivalent of the Lord of the Dead, and so he becomes the first human hinge between the great above, insofar as he has in common with the gods his immortality, and with the great below he has in common with the dead, that now he is the caretaker of the island world of the dead, where everyone wants to go to be buried. And so that explains, um, that explains why they have given him immortality and put him specifically on Dilmun slash Bahrain. So that's that story. Next, I want to look at the story of Itana, which is now another attempt to bridge the great rift between this world and the great above. The story of Itana is the story of the first man to fly to the planet Venus. Venus was the morning stars and the evening star associated to Inanna, later Ishtar. And what happens is that after the gods create uh, the city, the city of Kish, <clears throat> they want to have a ruler for it, and Ishtar selects Itana. He seems to be a noble shepherd. He'll work perfectly, so she puts him on the throne. Now, meanwhile, the story then shifts to the tale of the serpent and the eagle, this archetypal opposition. And the serpent and the eagle both live in, a, in the same tree. They live in a poplar tree, and they have made a covenant with each other to help protect each other's young and to be buddies. But one day, while <clears throat> the serpent is off hunting, the eagle goes down and eats all the serpent's eggs. And when the serpent comes back and finds out about this, he's very angry. So he prays to the god of oaths, which is Shamash, the sun god, and he says, the eagle has violated our covenant, uh, and by law, he needs to be punished. And so Shamash, Shamash tells him that he will be punished. He says, what you can do is, I know where there's a certain bull that's a dead carcass. Go hide inside of it. The eagle will come and eat it, and then you can get him. So he does this. The snake hides inside the carcass. The eagle comes down, lands, and the snake jumps out and gets him and rips off his wings and throws him into a pit. And Shamash helps him by cursing him and saying that you're miserable for violating this oath. And the eagle says, but yes, please, can't you relent and, and help me? This is a terrible fate. And Shamash says, nonetheless, I will help you. I will send a man to you at some point. Don't worry about it. So that's the situation there. Back to Etana. Etana's wife in the city of Kish cannot get pregnant. And so she tells him that there is a special plant that he needs to go in quest of to find that will make her pregnant. So he leaves the city and he goes on a quest for this special plant. He has no idea where it's going to be. So he wanders all over Mesopotamia, doesn't have any luck. Finally, Shamash guides him to this pit where this eagle, shorn of its wings, is this pathetic creature. And the eagle tells him, 
I know where that plant is. It's all the way up in the heavens, and I can take you there, but I need wings. So Atana creates a pair of copper wings. He's a smith, and he creates a pair of copper wings, and he puts them on the eagle, and the eagle then carries him up. He rides on the back of the eagle, and it carries him up into the heavens. There's a couple of cases where they fall and go up again and fall and go up again, but eventually they go all the way up into the heavens to the planet Venus, which is where the throne of Ishtar is. Etana comes before her th throne. She's sitting there with her sacred lions, and the story breaks off at that point. But we know from the Sumerian king list that Etana, it says there that he had a son named Bali who succeeded him. So obviously his, his uh, quest uh, was a successful one. So we have here an image of the bridging of the Great Rift now by a human being using a mechanical contrivance for the first time. He's doing a mechanized equivalent of the old Paleolithic shamanic ascent to the heavens by transforming oneself into a bird. Here, that's no longer possible. Now, uh, at this phase of civilization, in order to get to the heavens, you have to come up with a mechanical contrivance. And so human beings now are beginning to arrogate to themselves the powers of the gods by using technology to create earthly equivalents of what would normally be the powers of the gods, or in the old times would have been the powers of the great shamans. And he is rewarded for this. Note that. So the technological precocity of the Mesopotamians, we can already see that the West is going to come out of this, this tradition of technological precociousness. Now in the next myth, and the last of these four that I want to discuss, this is the story of Lugalbanda. Lugalbanda is the father of Gilgamesh, actually. So we go to the city of Uruk now, which had a solar dynasty in which Utu, the sun god there, uh, he's, he's named Shamash in the Babylonian tradition, Utu, the sun god there, gives birth to Maskaya Gasher, who then gives rise to Enmerkar, who is the inventor of writing, and indeed writing was invented at the city of Uruk, 3500 BC. Enmerkar is the inventor of writing, and he is the father of Lugalbanda, who in turn is the father of Gilgamesh. So Lugalbanda now, as the story opens up, is the eighth of eight brothers. He's the youngest of these eight brothers. They're all sons of Enmerkar. And Enmerkar has decided to go, to go to war against the city of Arata. Arata is somewhere in the east over the Zagros Mountains. So it's a long campaign, and they're all marching and marching and marching. And at some point along the way, as they're going over these mountain ranges, Lugalbanda becomes sick. And this now is a little bit like the Greek myth of Philoctetes, who, uh, on the way to the Trojan War, is stung by a serpent, and he has to be put aside on the island of Lemnos. In this case, likewise, Lugalbanda becomes sick. We don't know why. His brothers are puzzled. They have to leave him behind, and they expect him to die. So they put him in a cave, uh, which is where you note that you would bury a dead body. So they're already treating him like a corpse, and they surround his weapons and implements around his body. Uh, they provide him with provisions, dates and grapes and food and syrup and so forth, and they leave him. So they leave, and they clearly never expect to see him again. But now as he's lying in this cave, he can see the crack of the sun god rising and the light just shining through the cave. So he decides to pray to the sun god to help him. Then at night, he can see the moon shining through the cave. So he prays to the moon god, Nanasin, to help him. And then when he sees Venus, uh, the evening star, rise, he prays to her to help him. And the combined revivifying powers of these astral entities result in bringing him back to life, as it were. He, he had never actually died, but... So like Lazarus, on the third day, he comes out of the cave and he's revivified and restored by his communion with these astral planetary powers. And so what now happens is that Lugalbanda now recapitulates the technologies that led to human civilization. The first thing he does is he reignites the ashes of his brothers as fire. So he makes fire by striking flint together. Uh, this is the very first Promethean technology that brought the human being out from the, the state of sheer savagery, let's say. Then the next thing he does is he learns how to make bread. This is the agricultural re revolution. So now he starts grinding uh, using a mortar and pestle and then creates bread. And then he garnishes it with dates and syrup. And it's very good. Makes his own beer. That's the agricultural world. Then next comes animal domestication because he captures two goats and he ties them to a juniper tree. He catches a buffalo, ties that to a juniper tree. And while he's asleep, the god of dreams named Zangar comes to him in the night and says... What you need to do is sacrifice this sacred buffalo tomorrow before the sun rises. So he wakes up before the sun rises and he kills the buffalo, the bull, which note is the prototype for what will later be his son's deed, Gilgamesh, when he slays the cosmic bull, Taurus. So he kills this bull. The gods come down and they eat up all these yummy offerings and they decide to award him the epithet of Herald of Heaven. This is what they call him. And this is where the first half of the story breaks off. 
There's a middle part of it that's missing, but when the story resumes now, what happens is that Lugobanda has been wandering around in the wilderness, and he has come upon the nest wherein the young of the great thunderbird, the Anzu bird, this great magnificent thunderbird that may be a descendant of the creepy raptor birds that we saw at Nibali Chori, uh, has his nest, but the bird is out hunting. He's so large that he can actually pick up a buffalo with his talons. But the young are there in the nest, and Lugabanda treats them reverently. He he's outlines their eyes with coal, leaves scraps of meat out for them, sprinkles them with cedar oil, and then he hides and he waits. Pretty soon the Anzu bird comes down, and he's concerned at first because his young aren't making any noises. What, are they dead? He thinks, and then he lands, and he sees that they've been perfectly well cared for, they're sleeping soundly and peacefully like little babies, and he says, all right, whoever has done this, who has treated my offspring with such reverence, will deserve the epithet of the hero of Anzu. And so Lugobanda peeps out, and he says, well, it was me, actually, I did it. Uh, I'm throwing my fate at your mercy. And so the Anzu bird tells him, name your wish. I'll give you one, anything you want. What is it? And Lugobanda says, I would like for you to confer upon me the power of running faster than any human being ever has, because he wants to catch up to his brothers. The Anzu bird says, fine, now you have the power. And he says, I need to catch up to my brothers. So the Anzu bird flies, and in his shadow on the ground below runs this tiny little human being going like the comic book character Flash, uh, faster than anyone has ever run before. And there they eventually catch up to the regiment and they see them marching and the Anzu bird warns him and says, make sure you don't tell them that you have this superpower or they will revile you as an abomination. And he thanks the Anzu bird and he leaves and he goes back. His brothers are very surprised to see him. This is like the Joseph story now. They're very surprised to see him, but they accept him and they say, now we need to continue this campaign. So they come near the city of Arata and they find themselves in a trap in this canyon where they become surrounded by the warriors of Arata who get them lodged into this trap and hurl spears and javelins at them for about the course of a year. They remain stuck here. And so Enmerkar says, uh, "Can anybody is anybody willing to run back to a rook to ask the goddess Ishtar what we should do about to get ourselves out of this situation? Nobody else volunteers, and so Lugobanda says, I'm willing to do it as long as nobody comes with me, because he doesn't want anybody to know about his superpower. So he says, okay, uh, go, son, and redeem yourself. Lugobanda then, at the speed of light, in a single day, runs back across the mountains, goes all the way back to Uruk, into the temple of Ishtar, and he's out of breath when he gets there, and Ishtar says, what's, the, what's wrong? What happened to your campaign? Lugobanda tells her what happened to the campaign. He says, what do we do? Ishtar tells him that there's a curse on him, uh, on the group, and that it can only be removed by cutting down <clears throat> a special type of tree along the bank of the Euphrates and finding a sacred fish and bringing them back to her. So he goes and he does this, and this, uh, this is where the story ends, but it apparently removes the curse, and they are able to conquer the city of Arata, because the tradition is actually that uh, the city of Arup conquered the city of Arata. So now the interesting thing about this tale is that Lugobanda really is the first superhero in history. He has the same powers that the comic book character Flash does. But also there are a number of suspicious elements about this story that make me suspect that its author had in mind the planet Mercury and that Lugobanda is an earthly equivalent of Mercury, which is the fastest moving of all the planets. I think it goes around the sun in 88 days. And not only that, but the god Hermes, uh, in later tradition, was associated with writing, and we've already seen that, em that Lugobanda's father, Enmakar, was the inventor of writing. And Lugobanda here, in the role of messenger, is basically the equivalent in the oral preliterate tradition of communication, just like Hermes would be. Hermes has wings on his feet, and we've already seen that Lugobanda had the Anzu bird flying above him. And he's also been given the epithet of Herald of Heaven by the gods, the same epithet that Hermes had. I suspect that Lugobanda here is meant to illustrate to become a human equivalent of Mercury. So we have human beings now in these stories. The problem of the Great Rift is almost solved. It's not quite there yet. But what we can see happening is that human beings are either mechanically arrogating to themselves the powers of the gods, as Etana does, through mechanical ingenuity, or um, through or averting fate through mechanical ingenuity, the way Atrahasis does, he averts a catastrophe by using his mechanical ingenuity to construct an ark. Or in the case of Lugobanda, the human beings are granted superhuman powers by a benefice from holy powers that 
confer this on the individual so that human beings are slowly becoming more and more like the gods. They're actually attaining to heavenly status as though the gap in these stories between the upper world of the great above and the lower world of the human world were slowly being bridged. Uh, and I think we can see here that for the history of civilization, the Mesopotamians are the most technologically precocious right at the start, and the Western tradition will come out of them, primarily through Abraham when he leaves the city of Ur behind uh, and migrates. Whereas the Asiatic tradition of conservation and respect for the elders and a much slower development of technological innovation comes out of the Egyptian tradition. And the Egyptians, as we'll see soon, bring the cult of the revered ancestral dead to its apotheosis in the level of an entire Bronze Age civilization. So uh, that paves the way then for the next discussion, which will be the Gilgamesh tale, in which the Sumerians will resolve once and for all this problem of the rift between the human world and the realm of the divine.